So, hi, Neil. Thank you so much for coming on. I just want to start off with one simple thing. How is how fins related to human bones and limbs? Yeah. So if you look at um, fish fins, um, some of them look similar to our limbs in some ways, not all of them, but some of them actually, when you look at some fish fins, they have bones that could correspond to our arms. If you look at our arms, what you have is one bone that lies at the base, then two bones that lies in the forearm, then a series of small bones at the wrist and then fingers. If you look at some fish and not just any fish, fish from a certain time period in the history of life, what you find are some bone, some fish that have one bone and two bones and little bones, bones that correspond to portions of our arm, all set within a fin. So what that shows is that the, if you look at this in a historical way, that is many of the bones that we use in our arms originally arose in the fins of fish. And you can follow that with several lines of evidence. You can follow that in one line of evidence being the fossils, but you can also follow it in the line of evidence of the genes that make arms and legs and the genes that make fins of fish. And they're very similar. So you, you went back to genes. How is the genes similar to fish and humans? Because you're saying, yes, the limbs look very similar, uh, but then genes, like for someone who has no clue about it, how would you explain that? Yeah. So if you think about DNA, so we have about in every cell of our body, we have six feet of DNA, six, I mean, say two meters long strand of DNA that's crumbled inside the nucleus of every cell in our body. Now that DNA contains in humans around 20,000 genes. If you look at those genes, a number of those genes, in fact, many of them, if not the vast majority are also present in other animals, including fish. And if you look at the activity of genes that make our arms and legs, you know, so when we go from an embryo to an adult, our organs are built over developmental time in the embryo, right? Well, there are a number of genes that are turned on and off to make our arms and legs, to give them the pattern of that one bone, two bones, little bones, and so forth. Well, and we can identify what those genes are. We have the technology to do that, to look at what genes are active when our arms and legs are being built. And we look and we can look at the genes that are active in the arms and legs of, of mice and monkeys and frogs and birds, everything with limbs, right? But guess what? Those genes are present in fish as well. And we can see where are those genes active in fish? There, many of them are active in fish fins and making their fins. So many of the genes that are active in making our arms and legs are also active in making the fins, the forelimbs, the forefins and hind fins of fish. And we can swap the genes among species. Hmm. We can take a human gene and put it in a fish. We can put a fish gene in a mouse. We can see what happens. And we, it turns out they're very equivalent in a lot of ways. So, so genetically, our organs are very similar. It's really a remarkable fact. So then what happened? Well, how come a fish evolved to be a, a fish and we evolved differently? So I know like circumstances were different and that's how evolution works. But then now, why doesn't one fish turn into human and human? To, I mean, it sounds well, how like would that animal. happen? Yeah. <laughs> it would just, so basically what we're looking at are the products of hundreds and millions of years of evolution. Yeah. So if you were to transport, let's say you and I were to take a uh, time machine and we were to go back in time 375 million years ago. And we can kind of know what parts of that world looked like based on the fossil record. Um, what you have are a series of um, uh, critters that are around at that time, various types of fish. You had sharks, you had armored fish, you had all kinds of fish. And they had one group of fish that had arm-like bones in their appendages, in their fins, that had lungs and gills, that had all these things. And we can trace those in the fossil record to those fish, to becoming amphibians, then reptiles, then mammals and birds. And it's a long series of evolution, you know, um, uh, of changes of a fish evolving to walk on land because at the time land offered many advantages to that particular group of fish. And that was very special to them. And they were able to exploit that in a way that other fish weren't. So it's kind of like a family tree of life. You know, I have cousins, right? I have near cousins, I have far cousins, I have distant cousins, and it's a flourishing, a flourishing tree. And we see a tree of life today of which we're a part, which includes mice, which includes frogs, which includes amphibians, which includes fish, and it's a flourishing tree of life. 
but it was assembled over time. It was built. If we look at the fossil record, we can see sequentially how these changes happen. So no, so, you could not turn a fish into a human right now. Uh, so where does the uh, the the Tiktaalik? I'm sorry, I think I'm saying it wrong. Oh, you got it the second time, <laughs> Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik. Okay. So where does the records of Tiktaalik come from, and like, what significance does it have in the whole like story of evolution? Well, Tiktaalik is one of many fish um, that have arm bones inside its fin, that have lungs and gills that are very transitional between life in water and life on land. What makes Tiktaalik special is its discovery story. That is, we were able to use the tools of evolutionary biology to predict where to find a fish like Tiktaalik. We didn't look randomly in rocks. What we knew is that if we looked at rocks of a certain age and rocks of a certain type, that we could had a high likelihood of finding a fish like Tiktaalik in the, that, that world. And we knew that from previous discoveries that other people made. So it took us six years working in the, in the Canadian Arctic, but we ended up finding this fish. And if I was to hold this fish in front of you, it would be about a meter and a half long. Um, it would look like a fish in some ways, has scales on its back, fins with fin webbing, right? Um, and it had a lot of other fishy characteristics and its jaws and its skulls and other things. Um, but if you look at the shape of its head, the proportions of its head are very much like a land living animal. If you look at its, its the back of its head, it had a neck. No fish has a neck. If you look at um, uh, the fin, it had the arm bones inside the fin. Um, so it had a lot of traits that are, we see in land living animals embedded in a fish. So it was clearly an amphibious fish, a fish that was able to live both in water and land found at a particular time in the fossil record in rocks about 375 or so million years old. And it's not just, so Tiktaalik is one of a number of fish like that, that we know of now. Um, and each one of them shares those, those traits that are intermediate between fish and land living animal. You spoke about us searching for fossils at like specific locations. What are the key conditions to know that, okay, this is where I'm sure I'm going to find like a high, uh, like in you know, a volume of uh, fossil records. Okay. So scientific research begins with a question. You begin with a question. So like in evolution, you might be interested in, am I in origin of dinosaurs, origin of mammals, origin of bats, origin of, you know, whatever. We began this with the origin of land living animals. So if you begin with that question, and you begin to do some research on it, you can see that other people had found fossils over the years. And we can begin to see where in time this transition likely happened. We knew we began, before we began our research that around 380, 375 million years ago, there would have been fish of this kind around, likely based on other discoveries that are, you know, before this time, there were a lot of other very fishy things. After this time, you find things with true fingers and toes. So at this time, we should find intermediates. Okay, so you can identify places in the world that hold rocks of the right age to answer your question, right? And this the age here is 375, more or less. Um, the next is you want places in the world that hold rocks of the right environment to hold those fossils. Not every kind of rock can produce a fossil. Right? If it's superheated, like a volcanic rock or a metamorphic rock that was deep in the center of the earth. But also you want rocks that were formed in the environments that these kinds of creatures actually lived in. Right? You don't want, we don't want rocks that were formed in ancient deserts. You're not going to find a creature like that there. We don't want rocks that were formed in ancient deep oceans. It's not going to be living at the bottom of the ocean. You want rocks that are like near shore or in the ocean and the tidal area or upstream and where there, you know, there are ponds and rivers and so forth. You want that kind of stretch of things from near shore to, you know, in, in the, the rivers that lead to the ocean. And, um, you know, so you kind of want that kind of environment. And the good news is there's a geological signature to those kinds of environments. You sandstone, siltstone, chills. So there's kind of a geology to that. That's it. You look for places in the world that have rocks of the right age. You look for places in the world that have rocks of the right type to hold the fossils for several reasons. And then you kind of look for places in the world where you can access those rocks readily, that they're at the surface, that you can actually work those environments. You know, not every place can do that. You know, you want a place where 
um, the rocks are exposed beautifully and not covered by human activity or soils or things like that. So, you know, so it's a whole process of, you know, getting these layers of things to look for. If you do that in this case, what you'll find is there are a number of promising areas to look. And one of the most promising areas for us at the time was in the Canadian Arctic, um, stretching essentially 1,500 kilometers across the northern part of Canada. Um, big area, huge country, right? Um, what's not covered with ice is bedrock that's at the surface. Mm -hmm. And some of that surface bedrock was some of this stuff. Uh, and so that's what we began our search. It took us six years to find it because it was, you know, it was uh, uh, fossils are small. The Arctic's big. You can't mm -hmm. look at a lot of places, right? So. Are you aware of John Reeves? He's recently been on the Joe Rogan um, podcast where he talks about him finding old bones in the he's in Alaska basically there's a documentary series um with him called the Godfathers is there of is that of any significance or interest to you what about it it would be of interest or significance working in Alaska yeah definitely it'd be great but. yeah because the thing is there's just a loads and loads of bones that he has like you know uh, unearthed but there's not much research but it almost seems like you know a treasure trove of uh, information that would maybe you know give us more insight on like what happened in the past oh yeah i mean some things like that are always fascinating absolutely you know running into running into sites like that you know what we have are nowadays it's really interesting about this is there are a lot of sites that produce fossils the more you look the more you find that's hmm. the thing um you just have to know what you're looking for that's you know so a lot of people have walked over these rocks in the past but not all of them were looking for fossil fish hmm. right if you're looking for fossil fish, you're more likely to find them. If you're just looking at for other things, it might be harder to do. You know, um, you have to really train your eyes to find these things in a very big way. It's if I was to show you a picture of the site um, and it's like, here's a bone and here's the rock. You, you would think I was crazy. You would think I was nuts. And the reason is because the rock and the fossils are the same color. What you have to do is train your eye to see the differences in shapes, the differences in texture. And once you do that, you start to see teeth and jaws and other things like that. Where are the, like, what are the places that, you know, there have been discoveries with fossils itself, which has changed the whole understanding of where we are at with evolution and how we see it? Because I know that the Talek made a huge difference in, the, and like, you know, the discovery itself was like, okay, this is massive. And it gave great uh insights yeah tiktok's one of many okay there's been you know paleontologists do this stuff every year lots of them yeah. and so you know some of the most profound ones i think are some of the earliest so if you look there are places in southern china in western canada that show some of the earliest body plans of animals hmm. uh in soft body tissue these are like over 500 million years old these are just truly amazing sites um, there are some incredible sites in China and elsewhere of some early fish, particularly in China nowadays. There was a one described last year that was really great. Um, and there were a series of papers that came out that showed some of these early fish, early fish, you know, and early fins and things, teeth and things like that. Um, in this time period that I'm talking about now with, with like that are similar to Tiktaalik, there are uh, beautiful places in Greenland that have, that have held some nice fossils, places in Eastern Europe, places in Russia. Um, yeah, so there are some really wonderful fossil sites around the world, and I think we're only increasing those over time. I mean, over a matter of time, I think, you know, if you look at the kinds of rocks that produce Tiktaalik, they're present all over. They're in Spitsbergen, they're in Turkey, they're, you know, they're all over the place. So it's just a matter of looking. You spoke quickly about soft tissue fossils. Why is that different? And what's so significant about that? Yeah, when you think about fossils and fossilization, it takes a lot for a dead creature to make it into the fossil record. Think mm -hmm. about it. To be preserved for like hundreds of millions of years takes a special set of circumstances. The body, the, the critter has to die and then be buried very rapidly before it decays much. And then it has to be in a relatively undeformed location that's not messed around by movements and changes to the rocks. Um, and the tissues have to endure for a long enough period to be solidified by the minerals that are actually in the 
the, the, the soils that are compacting them. It can't decay much. The thing about it is soft tissues can decay very rapidly. There are a lot more circumstances where soft tissue can decay, skin, eyes, organs, things like that. Whereas hard parts like enamel and skeletons, like teeth and bone, they don't decay as easily, right? Because they're hard, hence hard parts, right? So they tend to make it into the fossil record much more readily than something that's soft that can decay a lot more rapidly, you know? And that's why much of our fossil record that we see, in fact, a lot of it are bones and teeth and scales and things like mm -hmm. that. Now, there are other fossils that are found that are incredibly important. So soft tissues are one, and there are circumstances where if something's buried really fast and there's not a lot of oxygen for them to decay, and the circumstances are really right with the microbial fauna, that you will get soft tissues and you can get soft organs and you can get skin and you get stuff like that. You can even see stomach contents in some cases of some of these fossils. It's really great. Um, there are other fossils still, like footprints and trackways, things that where things are scraping the muds. Those are other fossils too, which are really interesting as well. So, so what? What? I mean, I we get what extra information do we gather with soft tissue fossils? I know that like well, they are the more well, <laughs> well, I mean, if I find an eyeball, um, mm -hmm. that's a lot. I see the eye. Uh, mm -hmm. If I see the skeleton, all I see is the socket that the eyeball fit in. You know what I mean? So, uh, or for instance, there are some salamander fossils, which we were uh, discovered, which have the, the gills themselves. You can see the filaments of the gills. You know, you could see the shape of the animal. You can look at the texture of the skin. There are some techniques nowadays where you can look at the fossil and you can be in the, th and you can see what color this, mm -hmm. this, this fossil likely was. Um, you could begin to see, oh, in soft tissue, you could begin to see the embryos, what they looked like, you know, before there were skeletons, but there are balls of cells. You can see these sorts of things. Yeah. So it can be really amazing what you see in the fossil record, you know, and um, yeah. And again, the more we look, the more we find. One thing that's getting really interesting is imaging technology has gotten very sophisticated. So we now have high energy CT scanners See so right inside a rock, blast inside there, and you can see inside it, and you can, you know, you can begin to look at fossils three dimensionally preserved inside rock. Even better, you can go to synchrotrons, which are high energy light sources, which blast high energy photons into rock, and you can see microstructures, cellular structures inside the bone. And then, you know, to do that not only takes high energies and specialized imaging equipment. But it also takes very specialized computers, right, to put all those data together so we can actually visualize it. You know, so when you think about the revolution in technology in the last, say, I don't know, 20 years, it's not only the technology for imaging and seeing inside the rock, but it's also the technologies for visualizing it computationally because it takes computers to make sense of all that stuff so we can actually see it. So when we think about what soft tissues tell us, we can now see soft tissues in new ways with these new techniques that we wouldn't have seen before, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you can, you know, you can see colors, as I said before, of, the, of what creatures looked like. You can begin to see what their cells, how many cells they might have had in a certain tissue, how the bone was laid down, how, you know, how it grew, things like that. So pretty remarkable. How does uh, salamanders play a role in this whole story of evolution? Because they, they are very significant in how, what, like, you know, the transition phase between fishes to land animals. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Oh, salamanders are like, you know, I mean, I, you know, how much time do you have? We could be here for a couple, couple <laughs> about three hours. We could talk three hours. Salamanders <laughs> are amazing, right? Yeah. And the thing about salamanders is, you know, they have many different life histories. So some salamanders, in fact, most, they hatch and they're aquatic larvae. They swim around. And then they metamorphose into terrestrial adults. And during that metamorphose period, they lose the gills, they change the shape of the body. You know, in a, in a short period of time, there are so much changes that happen. So salamanders are creatures that are able to live in both water and land. And there are some salamanders that specialize in water, some salamanders that specialize in land, and some salamanders, in fact, many, that live in both in different parts uh, of their life. And so salamanders show us a lot of things. They show us how creatures can be amphibious. But salamanders have so many special features. Let me give you one. They can flip their tongue 
the length of their body, some of them, like in a millisecond. I mean, think about what it takes to be able to do something like that. So salamanders have also evolved very specialized abilities. The other thing they have is they have huge amounts of gene. Their, their genome is much bigger than human genomes, much bigger, huge. And um, there's lots of reasons probably for that. But they, um, you know, they, they have all kinds of specialized features. And in fact, when people first discovered this, uh, the sort of a, a apocryphal tale back in the 1800s, um, a, a box of salamanders was shipped to France from Mexico, Mexico City, actually, about six mm -hmm. salamanders. And these were salamanders that had um, gills. Um, they were clearly aquatic. So people who collected these salamanders in the 1800s thought that they were the perfect intermediate between life and water and life on land. Here's a tetrapod, a creature with arms and legs, but yet it had external gills, it clearly looked aquatic. So they sent him to a researcher in, in Paris to, to look at them. And uh, he got these six salamanders, looked at them great, set up a little enclosure for them, let them do their thing, came back to about a year later, and he looked in the enclosure, and there were now a lot more salamanders in them. There were the original ones with the gills and stuff like that, but there was a whole new set in the enclosure <laughs> that were, had a fully terrestrial um, ability. They had no external gills. They clearly were able to walk on land. So in that enclosure in one year, so much happened. And what happened is a new lineage, you know, the, the offspring of that original lineage, what happened is they underwent uh, metamorphosis, which the parents did not do, but they retained that capacity to do that. So the ability to metamorphose can produce changes that across the body, you know, and that's what this was originally um, describing this discovery. So they change within uh, like a quick, quick, like, you know, generation. Why doesn't that happen with everybody else? Because we don't metamorphose. I mean, there's good ecological reasons for us not to do that. Hmm. You know, so we do most of our development in the womb, as do mammals and birds. They do it in the egg. We do it in the womb. Um, and, and usually what you see is in this metamorphic life history, what you tend to find is it's aquatic creatures that also have a terrestrial stage. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So they're, so they use metamorphosis or they're metamorphosing into from a larva, which, which lives and feeds in a certain way to an adult, which reproduces and, and moves about in a different way. So when there's different ecological niches for adults versus the, um, juveniles, then they tend to undergo um, metamorphosis. We tend to be much more continuous in our development, living within, you know, being due. Most of our development happens over nine months in the womb. Hmm. After we're born, it's kind of just growing. Yeah, there's some things happening developmentally, but we're kind of just getting bigger. We're learning, you know, we're learning from our parents and the world around us, but we're not like developing new organs. It's not like limbs are sprouting out, you know, while we're, you know, one years old, right? We've already done that in the womb. So development in mammals tends is, is the, the main pattern formation happens in the womb and in, in birds and reptiles, it happens in the egg. Uh, largely because we're living in the same ecological niche hmm. as babies versus adults. It's not like, you know, human babies are aquatic and the adults are terrestrial, right? I mean, we're all terrestrial living in the same environment. In fact, that's essential for us, right? It's essential for us, for parents and offspring to be living in the same environment because that's how we learn so much about the world right we learn language we learn so much about the world from our parents from our from the environments we're raised in so it's essential that we have that we're social species so it's essential that we have that connection we wouldn't have that connection if we had like you know offspring living in one environment and yeah sorry in, in, in juveniles living in one environment and adults living in another so so salamanders breathing out of water what other like fishes that are we aware of or, like what's the like you know the connection between being able to breathe underwater and then lungs as well because i know from your work that you've mentioned before that fishes there are some with you have air sacs and like can you expand a little bit on that mm -hmm. definitely so if you look at fish they have lots of different ways of breathing when they're living in water the, one of the best organs that, you know, can grab oxygen from the water and release carbon dioxide into the water are gills. Gills are great because they have lots of surface area. They have lots of blood vessels. 
They serve very well as respiratory organs. Um, but there are times when the oxygen content of the water can vary a lot. It can get really low. And in some places, this can change from season to season, from fall to spring, what have you. And so fish have evolved a number of different kinds of respiratory organs that allow them to breathe when the oxygen content of the water gets really low. One of those um, organs that fish evolved are, are lungs. Mm -hmm. There are a number of fish out there that have lungs. Lungs very similar to our lungs. They're paired sacs. They're formed by similar sorts of cells. They develop in a similar sort of way. In fact, sometimes the genes that make them are similar to the genes that make our own. So they are versions of our own lungs. But what these fish do have is they have both lungs and gills. And these are alive today. You can see them around. They have both lungs and gills. Um, and they use the gills when the oxygen content of the water is sufficient for their activities. When the oxygen content of the water is not sufficient for their activities, there's oxygen concentrations are much higher in air. And it's much easier to get that, so obtain it. So they'll go to the surface and they'll actually gulp air, bring it down into their lungs, you know, and then breathe, you know, and then that do have the metabolic activities, and then you know maybe breathe once every fifteen minutes, every half hour, or something like that. So you have fish with both lungs and gills. Now the fish that have lungs and gills are actually kind of primitive fish. So if we compare them, see where they sit on the evolutionary tree. Some of these fish with lungs and gills are actually some of our closest living cousins of fish, which <laughs> makes sense, right? So what's interesting here is, and this is interesting for the evolution idea, and that is that um, lungs weren't an invention that came about as fish took their first steps on land. Lungs already existed in fish living in aquatic ecosystems. In fact, arms and legs in fins already existed. In fact, much of the sort of necessary organs that creatures needed to be able to walk on land had already er evolved, arisen for, to enable fish to live in like shallow freshwater or saltwater ecosystems. You know, they walked on the bottom of the water, they'd come up to breathe air when the oxygen content got low so that when the opportunity came or the net need came for them to walk on land. They already didn't have to evolve anything much new. They were already kind of able to do part of it, you know? And they were all able to maybe live in the interface between water and land. So that's what most people don't realize is that evolution doesn't always take, you know, new features evolving to enable something to happen. Sometimes creatures just use old structures in new ways, repurposing. We do this all the time with our own stuff. That's what evolution has done over hundreds of millions of years. And, and we see that over and over and over again. And that was the topic of one of my of my recent book. So speaking of genetics uh, and then in a way, so how is this evolution in this way? Like, you know, the features are already there, but then they're expressed at the right time so that like, you know, evolution can take place. Uh, is that similar to mutations? Like, cause that's a rapid change. And then like, you know, if it's the environment is suitable, then those, those genes are expressed and then the rest are like, you know, discarded in a way or like, you know, uh, muted during that time. Yeah, I mean, so look, mutations always happening in our genome. Every time DNA makes copies of itself, there are mistakes that are made. And that's happening right now in you and I as we're having this conversation, hmm. you know. Um, and some of those mutations will make it into the next generation if they're in a, you know, in a reproductive cell, whether it's an egg or a sperm or what have you, if those mutations are, you know, incorporated into the offspring from germ cells, um, that's what happens, right? Um, uh, that's always happening. But when you think about evolution, and a mutation is a big part of novelty and evolution, it's new stuff, right? But when you think about it, mutations, you get... So when you think about the genes that are necessary for evolution to happen, it's amazing how conservative evolution is. That is, yeah, new genes appear. In fact, they do new, new appear quite a bit. But a lot of evolution is using old genes in new ways, repurposing them. Just kind of like the lung story where, you know, you didn't have to wait for new stuff to happen mm -hmm. to invade land. Using old genes in new ways is just a great way to make things, right? And it's repurposing is kind of the story of life, whether it's at the level of organs or whether it's at the level of genes. So where does acquisitions come into play and viruses with this whole picture? 
Well, viruses, um, are, <laughs> you know, we, we've been living with viruses for three years, right? And so, um, you know, so I mean, there are different kinds of viruses out there, right? There's some in yeah. RNA, there's some in DNA, they interact differently with cells. So there's, the, the viruses are incredibly diverse. Um, they can do many different things. But there are some kinds of viruses. Now, this is not COVID. COVID doesn't do this. But, um, um, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2, um, the virus does not do this. But um, some do. Some viruses actually enter the DNA uh, to make copies themselves. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes the coronavirus, does not do that. But some do. And um, some of those viruses sometimes can be repurposed for new functions. That is, they'll enter the DNA, and then the DNA of the host organism will say, hey, they'll domesticate it. They'll turn it in to do something functional, right? Hmm. So actually, if you look at our genome, and you look at a lot of genomes, a lot of creatures, it's actually a graveyard of a whole lot of ancient viruses that attacked. Some of those weren't just, like, neutered and killed. Some of them actually were repurposed to make proteins that are necessary for life. Um, and some of them, some of the proteins involved in making memories in our brains, some of the proteins involved in present pregnancy and immune response, um, those relate to um, originally viruses, you know. So some of the novelties of genomes that we see are actually derived from viruses. So there's different ways to get new genes. Viral, modifying ancient viruses is just one. And that's like one version of nature splicing what it wants from uh, another thing and then putting that's it right. into yeah that's right uh, you kind of mentioned that salamanders have more genes than humans so like you would assume that like you know we're more more evolved we are like more complex we would ha have more genes than uh, a salamander how do we like you know reason with that well when you think about it I mean, if you were to look at humans, you know, we have like a little more than 20,000 genes. Um, and that's not really remarkable relative to other creatures. It's not like, you know, and we, we view ourselves as, oh, we're the most complex creatures on the planet. You know, we have these brains, we can talk, we make stuff and do things. Um, but we're not doing it with a whole lot more genes, right? Yeah. Uh, so the complexity of a creature is does not compare to the number of genes in its genome. In fact, some genomes are so huge, like salamanders and frogs, or plants, some plants, and so forth. Um, and so, you know, how do you make sense of that? The way to make sense of that is to ask the question: Well, there's a lot. It's not just the number of genes that make a difference. It's how those genes are used. Some of those genes. It's it's how those where and when those genes are active. It's you know, one gene sometimes can make many different proteins in us. And mm -hmm. so the complexity of an organism and the complexity of its development and tissues um, does not relate to the number of genes inside because there's a whole sort of software. Mm -hmm. um, think of that. Think of the genes. They make proteins, right? Think of them as the hardware, as a computer, right? But then think of the software which controls the activity of those genes. Right. It's the software that's incredibly complicated in us, not the hardware. Right. So it's um, so and, and that is in the genome. So if you look at the genome of a human, it's huge. As I told you, it's like two meters long inside every single cell of our body. Right. Yeah. Think of that. We have 24 trillion cells in our body. Or so we have, you know, a two meters long of DNA in every single one of those cells. So if I was to take our, you, my DNA from every cell and just unwrap it and put it end to end, it would go from here to Pluto. That's in my body, that amount of DNA. And that's all of us. So it's an enormous amount of DNA. Uh, but only a fraction of that DNA contains genes. Small, like 2%, maybe 3%. So most of the genome is actually the software to control that 3%, which is the hardware. And hmm. that's where the complexity lies. So also, where does, like, you know, okay, we spoke about fishes and then land animals. Where does land animals and then animals that, started to fly take flight where is that connection and like why is there that connection what le led to that flight well flight actually evolved many times right so flight arose in insects float flight several times flight arose um with invertebrate organisms us so in birds and bats and pterosaurs several times flight has arisen in snakes which can glide and lemurs which can glide and squirrels that can glide so 
soaring through the air and having some aspect of powered flight is a strategy that has come about multiple times in the history of, of the earth. And every single time it's come about to nobody's surprise, you have some sort of wing-like structure that forms and that is powered. Now, the kind of flight you're probably thinking of is bird flight, right? Which is, you know, we think of flying out and critters, we tend to think of birds, but they're only one of several kinds of creatures that involve flight. Um, their kind of flight arose from ground living dinosaurs that were very fast running, you know, but the feathers that were necessary to, for that flight actually arose in dinosaurs that didn't fly. They rose for, rose for another reason. So it's, again, it's like the lungs. It's the, the inventions that were necessary for flight actually originally arose in creatures like not flying, you know, mm. they're just redeployed in new ways. No, but so flight is a very, um, uh, common strategy, dare I say, in the history of life. There are certain commonalities among all critters, critters to fly, but um, um, but you know it always comes about from creatures that are either running fast on the ground or are arboreal, climbing trees, and then you know want to descend and glide, need to descend and glide. What was the reason for feathers? Like I know, like we have fur or hair to warm ourselves up. Is it similar, or is there is there a connection? Connection. If you think about feathers. Um, there's a couple functions that they serve in addition to flight. So if you remove flight from the equation, what they do is they're thermoregulation. They're great thermoregulatory, right? They, if you have a creature that's warm blooded, like dinosaurs were, many dinosaurs were, feather, you need something, hair or feathers or downy stuff to cover that body. Otherwise you're just, you know, not efficient with the heat. And so initially it's likely that feathers were some form of insulation just like hair. Hmm. But once you have that insulation, then you have something that you can call it can get colored, it can be used for displays, it can be used for communication. So I think, you know, the origin of insulation is coupled with kind of the origin because it's external is coupled with the origin of communication, like, you know, animal displays, and, you know, and, and, and coloration, which is used for, you know, in behavior, diverse behaviors in birds. And certainly was in dinosaurs before the birds. What's what are you currently working on? Which you know you feel like okay, this is this is really significant. Yeah, we're really excited in many ways um, in the lab. We're working on a number of different things. Uh, we're working on joints. You know how joints develop and how they evolve. You know how the connections between bones evolve and what controls that. We're looking at the origin of the skeleton itself. Where did bone and cartilage and all these tissues come from? A lot of people have looked at these questions over the years. There are a lot of cool techniques and ideas that are out there and a lot of cool data people collected. I think the time is ripe. We're excited about, you know, that area of research. We're going back to the Arctic this summer to hopefully okay. find more fossils. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we're going to go back. The search is never done. So we're going to go to different rocks uh, in an uh, island called Ellesmere Island, kind of near where we found well, the same island we found in Tiktaalik, but about 60 miles away, 70 about 120 kilometers away, something like that. So, so where, like, what are the speculations like? So you're saying where did bones come from and why did they come from? Uh, what, what, what are you, what are, what are the, the things that you are pondering with and saying, you know, could these are. Yeah. I mean, the question is, you know, when did bone arise? Yeah. You know, we have, you know, so when we don't know. I mean, we have some ideas and there's a lot of controversy around that, but how early in the history of life did bone come about? You know, that's one question that's really big. The other question is, if you find those bones, what does it look like? You know, is it, does it look like teeth? Does it look like bone? Does it look like cartilage? You know, what, you know, how and how? So there's a lot of basic questions and, you know, and that I think we need to resolve. And so I want to get into that and that'll involve some field work because there's some rocks close to here that we want to look at. It'll involve looking at other fossils and maybe thinking about what early bone looked like and creatures that people have already correct, collected. So one thing about fossils is, is that, you know, ideally, like it's usually bones, like rare occasions or a few occasions, there's soft tissue, like you said. So yes. it w wouldn't it be a little bit of a different task to figure out what, where was the transition phase? Because again, there are no bones, there's no tissue, then there's nothing that you're working with. Right, but we don't really know. There's huge gaps in our fossil record, honestly. Yeah. You know? And so that's kind of what we want to fill with fossil record. Are there, you know, are there creatures that have um, 
you know, what we really don't know is what the earliest skeletons look like in any way. I mean, we have a sense of it and what those animals that had them were. We know they're jawless fish, but were they more like teeth or bone? We don't really know. And so there's big gaps in our knowledge and big gaps in the fossil record. There's a huge gap in the fossil record between when we find the first vertebrate organism or protovertebrate organism, it's not called vertebrate, it's called protovertebrate. Mm -hmm. And when we find the first creatures with a skeleton, it's many, many millions of years. And is that gap real? Or is that gap something that, you know, the, the, the skeleton didn't exist? Or is it just to require us to look in new ways at the fossil record, you know, find new sites, that kind of thing. So that's the question, you know, there's a big gap. Why do we have that gap? Is, it tell, is the gap telling us something? Or are we, um, are we missing something big? Yeah, maybe we're looking at it in the wrong way. Maybe, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Be nice. <laughs> yeah, There's room for science when, when it's like that. So, 100%. Uh, where can people find your work and, like, you know, about the books that you've written? Yeah, I mean, so a couple, my most recent book on evolution, which we actually covered some of the material about that today, is called Some Assembly Required. You can see mm -hmm. it came out in 2020. Uh, the, another book we talked about today. Um, is called Your Inner Fish. A lot of a lot of my work in there. That was a book. There was also a mini series on television, PBS, which you can stream online. It's called Your Inner Fish. It's on YouTube. You can you can get it there. So. And then uh, about social media, your websites, anything that would be good. Yeah, I can neilshoom.com is website. You can my Twitter feed, Instagram. You can find me on all the usuals. Okay, perfect. Thank you speak, so much for speaking with me. Thank you. Take care. Have a good one. Have a great night.